I'm David Scheinman, and I was in a group called N34, 34th group that was in Nepal. We arrived in December 1972. I guess I got sworn in probably February or March 73, and wound up staying until April 1976. I lived in a village called Shabru Basi, which is at the confluence of two rivers which drain the high Himalayas, around eight miles south of the Tibetan border. So I was the closest Peace Corps volunteer to the, well, officially it's the Chinese border, but we call it to the, the Tibetan border because that's where my cultural sympathies lie. <laughs> and the Tibetans I was working with were all Tibetan refugees who just came over the border um, when the Chinese took over in the 50s. And there were a lot of indigenous Nepalese tribes people there who were Nepalese citizens who were called Tamangs. So that's who I worked with um, for three and a half very, very happy years. And our village was around 5,000 feet. Everything else was higher than 5,000 feet. And I wound up working with farmers and developing apple orchards. I was in a trekking area, so I met people from all over the, the world who came to Nepal to go trekking, would come through my village. So, of course, being the knowledgeable guy, you know, people would ask, well, what trail should I take? And what about going to that area? Um, it, it was good. I mean, I, I met a lot of interesting people and shared a lot of information. So I had a social life that most Peace Corps volunteers don't have. And that's not why I joined the Peace Corps. Again, it was just serendipity, whatever. That's just where I, I wound up. But once I realized what I had there, I was like, whoa, this is Peace Corps Valhalla. The I mean, people travel 10,000 miles to go trekking here, and this is where I work. Oh, yeah, it's easy to get lost. Mm -hmm. Easy to die, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do that. I mean, I wouldn't say more than 1%, not, no, that's one out of 100. It happens. Mm -hmm. People walk off cliffs, people have accidents. It's funny, when you, when you walk to, up and down the trails, who do, you tell, who do you talk to? You, you make eye contact. Often you just keep walking and sometimes something happens. You talk for a few minutes. Some, I met a guy and we talked for an hour. It just happened. His name was Tom Grove. And Tom was from Hagerstown and he was traveling with a woman from California. And it's for, fortunate, as you'll see, that I stopped. Uh, he was Peace Corps Afghanistan. I guess there was some message that he was radiating that I, my inner, my inner compass picked up. So Tom and I talked for an hour, and this happened quite you know, relatively often, and I thought, oh, okay, he's a nice guy. A month later, uh, he was trekking up the mountains, doing the Long Tong Trek, and I, I was going to Kathmandu, wi winding down my affairs. Actually, I've got two stories. I'll tell you this one first. And um, I get to Peace Corps, and there's a big picture of Tom on the bulletin board, missing in Nepal, if you have information, contact the embassy. So I know that guy. So I went to the embassy and there was a rookie uh, consular, off consular officer because that's where they start their careers with visas and all this stuff. He eventually became ambassador, I think he's ambassador to Malawi. His name is Al Easton. <laughs> so I go to Al's office and Al's, Al's from Arkansas and the phone would ring and said, Al Eastham, and it sounds like, you know, Al Eastham of Al Eastham Chevrolet. <laughs> and um, I said, Al, what's going on? I, I know this guy. I said, oh, you know him? We don't have any information. His parents are frantic. I said, I saw him on the Long Tong Trek. And he said, I said, what happened? And he said, oh my gosh, our, some of our embassy guys were, our embassy security boys, Nepalese, they were in a bar and, and some local guy started selling his camera and his plane ticket and so they, they, they picked them up. I mean, they weren't supposed to, but they, they questioned them. And, and they told this wild story of some guy named Sunwar, you know, way out in, in Western Nepal, who had given him this stuff. And I, and I said, well, where, where's all this going? And, Al, and I didn't know, Al explained that the embassy didn't have any jurisdiction. The family, the guy was the, the, a preacher at a church in Hagerstown, and they're obviously going nuts. And here I was, I spoke fluent Tibetan, fluent Nepali, and I was just getting out of Peace Corps. I thought, I could do this. I said, hey, I'm free. I will be free. So first I was thinking, you know, they, they, they would hire me as a private investigator. <laughs> but, 
Hey, anyway, well, I realized that that wasn't going to happen. They'd, they'd pay some expenses, so I wound up doing it for free, of course. Um, this, I thought maybe the government would, you know, pay me or something. But so anyway, so I wound up getting involved, you know, with solving the mystery of what happened to Tom Grove, which I eventually did. But it had some really, really, totally unexpected twists and turns. Mm-hmm. So we we took two trips. One was, I guess, a couple of days um, out to, out to where we thought he might be. Interviewed some people. And decided that and that trip was just planned to be kind of short. And once once we we came back, realized we needed to take a second trip. Second trip took us all the way to Everest, which I think is, as I recall, it could be as much as you know 200 miles there and back on foot. And I went with his friend Jim Hicks, who was his partner in. Afghanistan. They were both Peace Corps Afghanistan. So I felt this affinity. It's my fellow Peace Corps guy. He's from Hagerstown. I'm from York. I'm, I'm, I really liked him. We really clicked. We just had so much in common. And he'd survived Afghanistan. I mean, there, there wasn't, you know, the fighting now, but it, it's always been a challenging, and a wonderful place, but challenging. And he worked together with Jim in grain storage or something. Jim was on his way home in Thailand, and once he heard that Tom was missing, he came to Nepal to help us out. So Jim and I go all the way to Everest, 200 miles on foot, raining sometimes, with a police officer just in case, and a body bag. And we got to one village, and in all the other villages, we tell the story about Tom is part of a set of twins. Here's his picture, have you seen him? And people go, oh, that's so terrible, we're so sorry for you. This one village, everybody acted completely differently. We don't know anything. We don't know a thing. Nope. And then there was, um, I have a picture of this guy, I think some one of you may have seen him, the picture of a guy with the beard that's on the desk. You'll see it when you, when you go out. That, that photo. That's a great photo. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I've got the original. Okay. okay. So anyway, uh, I was speaking to him in Tibetan. I mean, this isn't just your random llama. I said, what do you, what do you know about it? It was a place called Jiri, J-I-R-I, halfway to, to um, Everest. I said, do you know anything? And he said, I've got a vision that your friend is dead and his head is here and his body's over there. I said, that's unfortunate, but where? Because, you know, and all around we're looking in, ma- I mean, imagine being in the Appalachians or whatever. It's like, well, where do you search for a head? I mean, it's great that you've, you've isolated it to this area, but we don't have you know, 500 people like you would get together when a child is missing in Texas and roam around the swamp and have the state police divers in on it. And I said, there's just two, three of us. And he, he couldn't tell us that. But he said that, you know, your friend is up there and he's been beheaded. It turned out to be true. But that comes, it's, it's coming. So then we went to Everest. We came back and all we had was, we had a great trip. We figured Tom was dead. We, we figured he was murdered or he fell or something. Uh, and um, we thought that they should go back and investigate this particular village. So we wrote, I wrote a report, gave it to you know, the ambassador and the chief of police and everything. And that was it. And I left. But that's not the end of the story. It's like Paul Harvey. Now here's the rest of the story. Meanwhile, back in the States, Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford were neck and neck for the ni- 1976 Republican convent, um, um, nom- nomination. And ironically, this is in the news more and more because there's similarities between 1976, where they had this, I guess, brokered convention, because it was really close. So Ford is desperately looking for support. So what does he do? He calls up Tom's congressman who's a right wing, a rabid right wing nut, nut job, who was the first guy to get nabbed having sex in a bathroom with a teenager like four or five years later. It's all on Wikipedia. I, I forget, I'll think of his name in a minute. But he was the right wing congressman. And um, Gerald said, hey, who are you supporting? And the guy said, you know, Jerry, I'm, you know, I like Reagan, I'm a right-wing guy. And he said, can, is there anything I can do for you to get you to change your mind? And he said, oh yeah, like we got Reverend Grove's son is missing in Nepal. Can you do anything? We've, tr- we've had a search party, you know, we've worked through the embassy and we don't have results. Now, Reverend Grove's an influential man in our community and he's very well liked and the family is very highly respected. And he's the Reverend at, at Zion Church. 
and can you do anything? And Ford said, well, I'll do what I can. Picks up the phone, calls Ambassador Margarita Maytag of Maytag Watchers and Dryers. He says, Margarita, yeah, <laughs> get on this, <laughs> it's high priority. Calls the king of Nepal, because they're getting millions of dollars of assistance. A king, King Birendra, can, can you, um, so I have a problem. You know, he, I know this because Al Easton told me later. He calls the king and said, I need something. There's an American. It's high priority. We've got to find him. So the king calls his chief of police and says, hey, what do you know about this? And she says, well, we got some shine. We got some, I don't know, you know, mentioned, I got this report somewhere. So he fumbles around and he gets my report. And of course it says, go there to that village, the village of, oh, we will go. And he sends like, 30 army guys and they go to the village and a little girl comes like a, a 10 or 11 year old girl sees what's going on and bursts into tears and says oh, they killed him in his sleep and he's buried over there and his head is over there and it was terrible and we've all been told not to say anything and the army guys start digging in where the where that clairvoyant guy with the beard said that you know, he was beheaded in the mountains and indeed, that's what happened. And they, they found his remains and shipped them back. And he was, he was murdered. And I think probably what happened was it happened in his sleep and they were trying to rob. I mean, that's really unusual. But it was an attempted robbery and he probably woke up and resisted and there was panic. And it was, it, I don't think anybody meant to kill him, but they did. And then, of course, they had to have the cover up. And that's how all of his belongings got to Kathmandu because... They had to sell them somewhere, and you sell them in Kathmandu. Now, I'm still trying to find out how this guy voted. But if it wasn't for the 1976 convention, this would probably still be an unsolved crime because the king of Nepal never would have told his chief of police to send 30 people, 30 army guys, out to find this random American. So anyway, that's, that's how it was.